So uh, my name is Dan Rita, and we gathered here today so I can present to you the work I have undertaken during my PhD. And the title for the thesis is Learn Representations of Artistic Style, Image Retrieval, Description, and Stylization. Uh, now, the main overall aim of the thesis was to advance machine learning research in the domain of artistic style, such as digital art. Now, there were some disparate pockets of initial research in this area, and we aim to join them through a modality representation. And so we explore how such a representation can be learned and leveraged. Uh, but then we also explore several types of generative approaches to style in machine learning with projects on both content detail preservation as well as style-based content deformity. Um, so I'll cover these projects from the six papers uh, written during the PhD going from analytical to more generative. So first of all, when we say style, we refer to the visual appearance of an image in terms of visual aspects and attributes, not necessarily considering high level semantics or context um, authorship or anything like that. And that some data sets already exist with some kind of similar labels, like the BAM data set, uh, but these are only limited to like coarse level kind of style labels. And by coarse level uh, labels, we mean very broad labels such as, you know, watercolor, oil, sketch, and these kind of things. Whereas with fine grained labels, we mean labels that look at much more minute differences between the styles. And this diagram on the right kind of shows uh, a good example of what I mean. All of these fall under the same pen ink style. They're all quite clearly different in other attributes, such as the shading, the line thicknesses, even the lighting in some of them. Um, so a large scale data set of this type had not been collected before, um, likely due to requiring probably an impossible amount of work. You know, such a data set would require many expert artists with deep knowledge of all of the styles to create ontology, to have millions of images and all while, while agreeing with each other on every cluster, which was never going to happen. So if we introduce this uh, kind of data set, uh, BAMFG, uh, which extends the kinds of images found in the BAM data set, but with some fine grained labels attached to them. Uh, so we use data from behance.net, which is one of Adobe's platforms where artists can share portfolios of their work in projects that we noticed are very fine grained style consistent. You know, every artist has their own particular style. So we extract millions of such images uh, from over 100,000 different style groups. And then we further clean these up using a large scale crowd annotation exercise on Amazon Mechanical Tech. Uh, and we use both a consensus to get different tiers of the of style consistency strengths. Uh, so here on the left figure, you can kind of see uh, a before and after of this cleaning process, uh, taking some original projects from the hands and then uh, making sure that we filter out the non consistently style image. Uh, and on the right, you can see like some other examples of the finished classes that we can get uh, after this process. Um, OES contributed a model, which we called Aladdin, uh, and it disentangles style and semantic content in two primary ways. Uh, first, implicitly through the architecture. Uh, so we have a style encoder which extracts only global style features uh, via ADN statistics. Uh, and these are extracted from several layers in the encoder to capture information from multiple layers of feature abstraction before then being concatenated into a final style embedding. Um, but this style embedding is again split back up uh, and then used uh, um, as ADN parameters in the decoder uh, part of a, a model which then sort of stylizes in a way these features which are parts from the content branch to sort of recreate the, the image but using reconstruction. Um, and the ADA and values are matched between the encoder and decoder positions. So early encoder statistics are using the late decoder layers and then late encoder layer values are using the early decoder layers. Now, the second signal for disentanglement is via that band of G uh, data sets, star cluster labels. And they're learned through a supervised variant of the SimCLR contrastive loss. And at the time, at least, the contrastive loss was quite new. Uh, and our supervised use of it was quite novel. Um, also novel at the time was a type of gradient accumulation to allow 
extremely large contrast of batch sizes during training uh, on cheap consumer GPs, and we named that logit accumulation. Um, and we also ex further experimented with a discriminative model, such as ResNet, um, more like as, as a baseline uh, to sort of verify the effectiveness of the disentanglement by design. Uh, so both models perform the disentanglement through the data signal, um, but only Aladdin had the architectural disentanglement. Uh, and yeah, we did find Aladdin to outperform the discriminative model, uh, and we noticed that it relied much more on lower level features such as colors and textures, whereas a discriminative model like ResNet focused more on higher level semantics. Uh, but we also found that uh, the two embeddings are actually complementary. So when we concatenated them, uh, we gained a pretty small boost in accuracy, which is just great. Now, the strengths of these two contributions are very apparent when comparing to another baseline, uh, um, which we call the ML, uh, where they explicitly train such a discriminative model, but are just on a handful of coarse style labels from like an older data set. Uh, now, our model, ha having never seen these labels, still beats that fully supervised uh, model trained with those explicit labels. Um, and so we do set also a state of the art on coarse level discrimination. Um, but for fine grained uh, discrimination, we use uh, mean average precision and the IRK metrics to measure our success. And IRK here is a metric which resembles the top K classification accuracy, but in the context of imagery, imagery treatment, um, IR meaning instance retrieval. Um, yeah, there's, there's a few more relations in the Aladdin paper if you'd like to see more. But qualitatively, the Aladdin style code has demonstrated excellent style representation capabilities, which has been especially useful for image retrieval and clustering. So we published this paper at ACC 2021, and Adobe currently uses Aladdin as the backend model for image search on their Behance platform, as this little video shows just a screen capture of the website. Uh, and the model has also actually been used in a separate AHRC research project, which was called Deep Discovery. And this was a need towards a national collection program. And this was done in collaboration with the National Archives, the Royal Botanical Society, Gainsborough Trust, Victoria and Albert Museum, and may maybe others. Uh, yes. However, we didn't stop there. <laughs> so we've ex further explored the at the time, novel uh, VIT models of so vision transformers. Um, and these were especially interesting to us due to the intuition that the layers in these models had a much larger receptive field size in the pixel space. Um, and so, by this, what I mean, if you look at this top right uh, figure here, which is a CNN, in a CNN, each, each layer looks at just small patches in the input based on you know, the, the filter size. Therefore, it takes progressively more and more layers to see more of the input image in one single convolution. Uh, but by this point, having passed through all these layers, the feature abstraction has already grown up uh, a fair bit. Uh, in the VIT models, by comparison, um, this receptive field size grows much faster, uh, meaning much larger areas of the input image are used even in those early layers. And this is great for other main artistic style, because style is a global attribute of the image, not really something you can localize somewhere in the image. So this means I guess more more ways to capturing them, more global information, which is great. So we in integrated the VIT model into the Aladdin architecture, just replacing the styling pair we had before. We still maintain that content style branch split, and we still enforce the style embedding to be split into the uh, ADA and parameters to be used in a deep way. And still using the band of GDA to set and contrastive learning as before, we managed to push state of the art further, meeting not only our previous design, but also that fused variant with the complementary embeddings from the two different models. Now, Aladdin VIT is actually part of our second project called Style Babel. And this is a project where we, again, aim to learn a style representation, but not just over the vision domain, but also the language. You know, such an embedding of such a, uh, several potential use cases, such as automatic style tagging, automatic style captioning, and querying style-based image retrieval, but using text. 
Um, however, again, no style focused data sets existed until this point. So we had to create our own. Now, the data set collection process was performed in a multi stage process across several weeks and months of review in collaboration with two art universities, which is the University of Edinburgh and the University of Northumbria, the two art universities. Um, now, gathering free form style annotation is difficult. Uh, mainly due to its subjective and sometimes ambiguous nature. So to perform a well-structured annotation process, we used a novel application of rounded theory for data set prediction. Now, this is a qualitative research method, usually used in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, so participants engage in unconstrained data clustering exercises, while also simultaneously evolving a shared vocabulary. So the workers, this being the art students and some faculty members, um, who took part in several stages of data labeling, examining style coherent clusters of images from the lab in space. So working uh, first of all in individual sessions and then in group sessions, uh, they gathered some initial cluster level tags, then they harmonized them, and then finally refined them again all at the cluster level. And then finally, there was another Amazon Mechanical Turk stage, carried out to individualize the labels to the image level through refinement by filtering, which was easy. Uh, but we also collected natural language captions. Uh, first of all, from the art students, I get again at the cluster level, and then we individualized them again to the image level uh, with an internal expert team of annotators that we, we trained for this task. Um, and they were given the final image level tags, the cluster level captions, and of course the images. Uh, now, the most important step in this process was actually the group stage, uh, where the art students collaborated on the harmonization of the tags. So this here image on the left shows a capture of the online environment we built for them, this task during COVID. Um, and students were shown a random cluster of stylistically similar images in form of a mood board. Um, and this mood board was pre-populated with some post-it notes containing some initial tags that we gathered gathered from them in the previous individual stage. Um, and then in groups of roughly five, they collaborated in real time for about a minute per keyboard to add, remove, or edit these post-it notes while having like a, a live discussion, getting some faculty members. Uh, and this figure on the right shows how even for two very similar looking clusters of styles, this process has helped to dramatically increase the quality of the tags while also harmonizing a much more consistent writing style, which is quite important for us. Um, and still maintaining the fine range tag differences, uh, including the, the fine differences in, in the styles between these two different clusters. Now, in terms of models, uh, we based our automatic tagging model on the similar architecture to OpenA's clip model. So we actually use their text transformer, but then we use our VIT Aladdin as the vision encoder. Uh, and we just train a small MLP head on top using a contrasting loss, very similar to clip. Um, and we use a WordNet score for measuring the quality of tag retrieval, which is sort of like a soft version of the IRK metric, where we use the WordNet distance instead of averaging over binary scores because some words might be different, but they might have very similar meaning. So we want to capture the information. Uh, so our model, when trained on style label, exhibits much better accuracy compared to the web scale pre-trained clip model. And we also show the value of our net novel data annotation pipeline with the increasing uh, accuracy following the various different annotation stages. Um, and yeah, the shared multimodal embedding enables zero shot image tagging, again, specifically focused on the artistic style rather than the semantic content. Uh, and we can also reverse that, so we can use tag queries to perform style-based image retrieval, but from language. Again, focused on artistic style rather than any semantics depicted. And finally, we can also perform automatic natural language captioning, uh, focused on the style rather than the content. And uh, we do use a custom model for this, but that architecture isn't too important. The main important design, design decision in that was for it to mainly av avoid a region of interest approach, which is what the captioning models were using at the time. Really. 
Um, mostly because like these models are very heavily skewed to its semantics. You know, I was still saying earlier, star can't be localized to some area of the image. It's a global property. Um, so yeah, we published this work at ECCV 2022. And uh, Adobe has used this internally for some things. Uh, okay, so moving on now to some generative applications. So we initially started exploring uh, the use of the style embedding in the domain transfer models, such as talking about encoders and cyclegam. However, we noticed that the image quality of cyclegam was actually better than talking about encoders, uh, just at the cost of the generality. Um, now, cyclegam's main limitation is being constrained to just two domains of the sort of tune. But we hypothesized that if there was a good way to inject style and conditioning into this process, and we can reintroduce that generality and hopefully keep that higher level image quality. And we thought one way to do this would be through hyper networks. So hyper networks are a class of neural network that generates the weights for a different target neural network. And generally, these hyper networks are themselves conditioned upon some other input which is different to the one that's given to the target network. And now these hyper networks have been used for a large variety of tasks such as language modeling, handwriting generation, machine translation, image shape reconstruction, in painting, and text speech, and since writing, there's probably many others as well. Uh, but one single hyper network model cannot reasonably generate all of the weights in the target model in just one for a single forward pass. As you'd very quickly hit memory the restrictions and then also the learning itself wouldn't really work as well as well. So instead, the hyper network is used multiple times iteratively generating weights for separate locations in the model. And we condition the model, the hyper network with the location in the target model to generate the weights for using some indices. Uh, and the second issue kind of similarly is that the sizes of the weights vary at different points in the model, so you can't generate the same thing over and over again. And the solution for that was just to uh, find the largest common denominator between all the different weight shapes we had to generate and then tile the way it's generated, um, then we're also finishing the hypernetic from the tile index. And finally, we also find that the hyper learning process is far more stable if we generate deltas to the existing cycle gang weights rather than to generate them from scratch. So putting this all together and then also using this uh, style and embedding this conditioning, we have a hyper network weight generator that generates the weight deltas for both the generator and discriminative part of the cycle gamma. Uh, so we had some good early results with this technique, but we were still limited by capacity in the number of styles we were able to represent. So we just need to scale uh, to maybe a model such as star. But the same principles apply. Um, now, star gamma models are much larger and can, def can therefore represent a much wider variety of styles. And they've traditionally been studied in the context of portraits. So for this project, we'll just limit the scope to star transfer of portraits. Um, however, the larger capacity doesn't come without its problems. So to use a hyper network to generate the weights for a star gamma model, we would need about 3 billion weights. And this was several years ago. Um, so instead, we generate the deltas that shift the mean of an entire channel's weights at once which drastically reduces the total number of weight deltas that need to be generated at the cost of some quality. Now, actually, this is an idea from, from a paper called Hyperstyle, which was a concurrent work released just before else with many shared ideas. Um, but they also target Stargan for, for the facial reconstruction and semantic editing. So there's some changes, some differences. Um, so we drive a stylization signal using a patch per occurrence discriminator. Uh, however, given the patch driven nature of that discriminator, we also guide it using semantic segmentation regions, sort of in order to keep the associations of styles bound to semantic regions such as pair, face, and backgrounds. Um, so we guide both the Aladdin conditioning and the discriminator's patch sampling with pre extracted semantic maps. Uh, we use the intersection of union for random patch selections to select the patches from the appropriate places. And this process basically just ensure, helps us to ensure that the star conditioning and star losses are applied between matching regions. So patches of stylized hair are only matched to uh, patches of 
for example, style, hair, um, same for face, and then same for background, and so on. And given our style code conditioning, we're able to allow smooth interpolation between the styles. Um, but also, interestingly, using some orthogonal research surrounding StyleGAN, we're able to provide some further higher level artistic control over the generation process to affect further aspects of the image in addition to the visual textures and colors. So, for example, adjusting the age of the subject, the facial expression, as well as orientation. Uh, so, we use directions in StyleGAN latent space directing, directed using this model called Interface Scan. And so, parallel advances in isolating further uh, disentangled latent directions of semantic changes can also be applied to our model to enable further vectors of control. Uh, so, we've presented HyperNST at the VizArt workshop, which was held at ECCB 2022. Now, one of our next projects was NEAT, and this is a more traditional type of neural style transfer project. Uh, and actually, this was undertaken during my internship at Adobe. So there were several decent neural style transfer works out there, but none of them were good enough to use in production. So with this project, we aim to basically scale that up and achieve that level of quality. And in this project, we use our Aladdin style embedding as part of a stylistic prediction model that we trained, for which we well, we used for creating a much bigger and much more diverse and high resolution data set. So similar in a way to the multimodal style label tagging model, we used a VIT branch for the content information and an Aladdin VIT branch for the style information. And then we trained a small MLP head to classify if an image was stylistic or not. So what was it an artwork or was it, was it something else? Uh, so we trained this observing model ourselves using style table data. Now we then additionally annotated for is it stylistic or not. Uh, so in the end, I think we collected about 2 million style images from Behance and then another 2 million content images from Flickr. Now we made sure to only collect very high resolution images uh, and I'll, of course, we also pre-filtered this data with the stylistic prediction model to make completely sure that only stylistic data is included in the style set and only non-stylistic data is included in the content set. Uh, as for the NEAT model, one of the main key differences to models from literature is uniquely designing the model to predict deltas over the content image rather than to regenerate the whole, the whole image from scratch. Now, motivation for this being that previous work required a bit of a delicate balance between the style transfer and the retention of content details. And through a design such as this, we avoid having to incorporate as much content information propagation through the model. Now, all of the structural information is already available in the original content image. So we'll just use that. Um, so yeah, we just focus on just learning the stylistic changes that are required and then apply those over the image instead of encoding and decoding the content image. And actually, this is critical for high resolution style transfer, uh, this being 4K plus kind of resolutions, where such an encoding and decoding process is just far too lossy. Um, and actually, this is where the title of the model comes from, uh, neural artistic tracing from the artistic technique of drawing over a faded projection of the content. And this figure shows exactly the kind of benefit that this editing and reformulation can achieve. So in the middle column uh, is a tiny crop from a high resolution content image. And on the sides are stylized versions of that crop with um, the furthest columns having an even smaller, tiny crop. Um, now on the left, two columns, is are some visualizations of our model having been trained for just normal RGB regeneration. Whereas on the right, the right two columns show our model with this editing reformulation. And I think a good example to look at is potentially this taxi uh, up here, where with this editing reformulation, you can even read the license plate. Whereas on, on previous kinds of works, you could definitely could. But there are some additional design decisions to consider with the Deltas approach. Uh, so this 
figure shows kind of one of the biggest problems that can arise. Now, if there are some strong colors in the content image, simply predicting deltas over the content image is not enough to fully suppress the colors. And we've experimented with several approaches to mitigate this, including using just grayscale image priors, or potentially using just certain channels in a different color space, such as HSL or OK Lab. But in the end, we actually achieved our best results through first pre-recoloring the content image with the colors from the style image. And we did this through a simple alignment of the unique variance matrices. Another small issue might be you know, the consideration for how much detail do we want to propagate. You know, not everything should always come through. For example, a stylized photo of a landscape shouldn't necessarily contain all the individual blades of grass if it's a high resolution image. Um, so we had to use a controllable pre-processing step for some slight blurring and some bilateral filtering, uh, which removes some of this texture information, but while preserving sharp edges. Um, and finally, we also use our content files of 0 0.5 strings to provide the model with some more control of the output, um, making it even more similar to heuristic tracing. Uh, and our final contribution uh, with this particular project is a solution for style halos, which is an image artifact that very often happens with previous NST literature and has just never been solved. So we studied the problem and we concluded that these halos happen at the transitions from areas of high frequency textures moving towards uh, low frequency textures. So in these two examples, these halos occur at the, around the edges of the building against the sky. And in the bottom example, they happen around the edges of the squirrel against the like, low background. And in our work, we mitigate this issue through the introduction of a sober guided patch co-occurrence discriminator. Now, this is just a normal patch co-occurrence discriminator, but with the added design step of separating the discriminator into two separate executions. So first, it operates only between patches of simple textures from uh, the style image and the stylized image. And then second, it only operates between patches of complex texture from the stylized and style images. Uh, now, this is in contrast to a normal patch co-occurrence discriminator where the patches are just selected in random. Uh, and this separation teaches the model to not assign complex textures to small, simple areas and vice versa, which helps to solve the famous issue. Uh, and yeah, we use some several edge maps and intersection of union to select and sort patches by the average complexity. And there's some more details again in the paper around this. Uh, and the final note, is that we measured a wider range of capability for our model to generalize to more styles than before. Our previous work was limited to styles found in Wiki art, which only contains fine art, and in more specifically even European fine art from a few centuries. So we conducted an additional user study where we evaluated the stylization range of NEAT when trained on BBSD4M, our dataset, versus when it was trained on the usual wiki art and MS code for data sets. And we did find as well that the quality was deemed higher for the model trained on bbsd 4 m especially for the contemporary styles. So that was a neat project, and we're just currently in the review. And I'll quickly flash some stylization examples of some very high resolution images before moving on. Now, moving on to the Aladdin NST paper, and for this, I'll briefly jump back into representation learning. Now, this project actually turned out to be invaluable in the diffusion project, which we'll talk about next. Uh, so the motivational observation for this project is that even in state-of-the-art representation models, there is still some content entanglement. And this entanglement is due to inherent content entanglement in the actual data sets that are used. And this figure on the left, I can't reach, uh, shows how even in BAM FG, you know, the data groupings are style coherent, sure, but they also present similar semantic content. So on the top left, you have character designs, then I think it's interior 
as I said, the other one, portraits, one's stick photography. So it, it's still very semantically uh, similar. And we think that this might be because, you know, as an artist specializes in their, in their work, they might also start to focus more and more on a particular subject matter. Or perhaps these projects that they show were constrained by the requirements they were given around a particular subject matter. So instead of trying to learn a style representation from this entangled data, it might be better to use some state-of-the-art neural style transfer techniques, such as NEAT, to create some style consistent data with completely random subject matter to avoid encoding it. And this is what this figure on, on the right shows, just some synthetic data that stylized across any random content. So we train Aladdin and Steve by using a random NST technique dynamically in the training loop to create this training data. And this just replaces the labels that you'd find in a data set such as RFG. And this provides the style learning signal without any content entanglement. And we randomly select one of these NST models during the training loop to avoid uh, encoding any specific model's biases. Uh, and we use again a supervised contrastive loss for this, as before. Uh, and to do this, we in the training loop create two stylized images with the same style. And that way, there's always a positive that can be used in the micro image, with you know all the other images that are stylized being the negative uh, pair. Um, so we evaluated this embedding through image retrieval over an unseen test set, which is also generated with synthetic data to ensure disentanglement. And we achieve, we achieve state-of-the-art retrieval performance while being almost completely unable to do any content retrieval to relieve the lack of entanglement with semantic data. And we did also test with some real data without NST uh, by evaluating retrieval of image patches. Now, these are not fully disentangled, but the small crop sizes help to split the content apart a little bit. Um, yeah, there's, there's some other observations in the paper, uh, especially experimentally showing the value of specifically using an ST and style signal compared to something more traditional like just patch based self supervised learning. <laughs> and additionally, just for fun, we also say, say a state of the art on the style level multimodal representation through some fusion. So, by itself, Aladdin NST was competitive, but it didn't quite beat uh, Aladdin VRT for the for the, for the tagging, and I think this is just because the star label data set itself isn't fully disentangled. But by inspired by the fusion we did in the first Aladdin project, we tried fusing the Aladdin NST embedding with the Aladdin VRT embeddings, which does have some entanglements as we just showed. And with this approach, we actually managed to significantly improve the quality, and we raised the word score from point. Three by two up to like four point no, point four one five project project. Um, and yeah, I think Adobe are currently in the process of patenting that. Yeah, that's good. So that brings us to the final project of the PhD, which was Diff NST. Uh, so this project achieves zero shot feed forward text free exemplar based star transfer using pre-trained diffusion models such as stable diffusion. And it does this through attention manipulations learned with some auxiliary uh, modules. Uh, and also it achieves form definition in style transfer, which is a capability that has been elusive to previous literature. Now, a common limitation with neural style transfer is that typically the best that these models can do is just change the colors and textures of the content image to match those from the style image. But artistic style can be much more than just those two things. You know, you also have artistic styles which focus on the deformation of the subject matter. You know, a famous example for this might be Picasso, who drastically changes the composition of a face, for example, and that's what sets it apart. But you know, these kinds of artistic form changes have been very difficult if not impossible to achieve with previous NST work, at least not in a general way. And it is this that we especially aim to achieve in this project. Now, the thinking is that for a model to be able to achieve such edits, 
it kind of needs to have a really good understanding of the world, you know, some sort of internal world model, if you will. And this capability was quite evident in these text to image generative models, such as stable fusion. You know, but you'd also often see correct reflections in generated images, good object proportions, relative placements of objects in the scene, and, and things like that. So it knows something. So we started exploring initially the prompt to prompt technique, which is a technique which allows editing already generated synthetic images through some prompt modifiers. So for example, if you have a, pro a generic prompt saying a squirrel, and you generate that particular squirrel, you can then change that uh, squirrel by adjusting the text prompt to something like I don't know, a squirrel in the style of Van Gogh, which is actually this version. And it would regenerate that exact same squirrel, but with a different style. So we took many, many of these kind of changes to prompts, and we studied and examined the differences in latent attention space to verify actually an initial hypothesis, which was that actually most of the style information is found in the V values in the self attention modules. Now, as a very quick refresher, the attention mechanism is used to weigh the importance of different parts of an input sequence when processing it. And it involves three, three vectors. The uh, Q, which represents the current input or element the planet uh, focusing on. K, which represents the relevance of each element in the sequence to every other element, including itself. And V, which contains information associated with that element. So we targeted self-attention instead of cross-attention of other works. Um, because neural style transfer as we know it is event published. So using a reference style image rather than text prompt to describe the style. And cross-attention using stable diffusion brings text prompt information into the diffusion process, whereas self-attention uses only the information propagated through the diffusion process. So the actual image itself as it's being generated. There are some other design decisions to consider to actually make all of this work. But the overall simple idea was to use frozen stable diffusion weights, and then the content and style data from our BBSD forum data set that we introduced with Neat. Uh, and then we trained a number of small modules to perform attention manipulation over the V values uh, sitting in each other's self-attention modules. So we injected the structure of a real content image by performing the VIN version. And as for the style, we well, we inverted the image also, but then we extracted the its attention V values um, from the self-attention during its reconstruction, um, and we cached those. Then we took the content noises and the style attention V values, and we sort of interleaved them, we injected them into the stylized image reverse diffusion generation process. And the trainable modules are just some small NLPs sitting in those self-attention blocks, and they generate those brand new attention V vectors for use in self-attention. And they're given as input the current um, self-attention Vs. The attention Vs from the style image at that particular time step in that particular location. Uh, and we also give it an image. It's not the starting day. Now the process works even with just using the attention to these or if just using the Aladdin for the style information. But if we use both, we actually get better quality because then we introduce not just local uh, style information, but also global style information. Uh, yeah, it just looks better. Um, as for training, uh, well, we, what we did was we unrolled this entire diffusion process over 50 time steps and then applied some standard NST losses over the final generated image. So we run the inversions, step through all 50 time steps, decode the final style image, then apply some uh, standard NST losses, actually the same ones we need. And then we back propagate the loss back to all of the time steps, which sounds like a lot in the case, but uh, well, there's one thing to clarify. Uh, and in def NST, we perform style transfer again using just exemplar style images. So only the style image is provided for style information, and only the content image is provided for the content information. 
No text prompts are used anywhere in this process. We do not want to use text prompts for style transfer because text is a very coarse way to communicate style. And fully describing style information in an image is uh, difficult, if not impossible, to articulate. You know, an image is still worth a thousand words. So use stable diffusion as the backbone diffusion model, which is a text to image model. But actually, that model is executed twice for any standard text to image generation. First of all, through text prompt information conditioning. And then another time in an unconditional way, which doesn't use text prompt conditioning. And what only happens is, is the values from both those ex executions are merged with this classifier free guidance. But seeing as we're not using text prompts, we actually don't even need to run the conditional branch of the model. So we don't. We disable it and we only use stable diffusion in an unconditional way. Now, this is the same as if we were to set CF2 to zero. And actually, the same works also if you just freeze a generic text prompt for every single information operation. But for compute and speed and memory constraints, we just disable it altogether. Um, and we also use some other tricks for speed and memory, including some from the control network paper. Now, one edge case, a uh, failure case with this approach, is the creep of some strong semantic features, such as faces, into the stylized output. And this occurs because of the content entanglement in the style embeddings. But using a much more strongly disentangled LAN and LSD embedding, this issue can be fixed. Uh, now, one of the ways that the stylization can be controlled at inference time is stylization strength, as usual. Now, this just constro controls how strongly the style is applied to an image. And we can control this through limiting the last time step at which the information is interleaved into the diffusion process, that being the style attention values and the ladder codes. Interleaving them until a later time steps introduces more style information into this process. Now, the other inference time control is content deformation. And this is a capability which is unique to the FNST. And this is a control for how strongly we can allow the style to affect the structure of the content in the stylized image. And this can be controlled by delaying the starting time step in the reverse diffusion process in which the inverted content noises are injected. So if you inject content noises from very early on, you can mostly reconstruct the image uh, you know, with most of the details as expected. But if you hold back content noises for more and more time steps, the only information that the uh, diffusion process will have is the style information, which is still being interleaved. Um, and this being an unconditional diffusion, the generated image will resemble structure components uh, more and more similar to these ones from the style image. And going back to this figure, here we can kind of see how DFNSD quite strongly demonstrates deformation capabilities compared to previous state-of-the-art NSD techniques, including it. Uh, you know, here we can see the previous work, preview of previous works tend to mainly adjust small things here and there in the content image, whereas DFNSD completely reimagines the image, heavily making use of style information from the style image and things like the composition, the structure, and other details of the image. Uh, and yeah, that was DFNSD, which was the last project of the PhD, and it is also currently kind of under review. Uh, so yeah, to summarize, we started off with the Aladdin project, which was the first fine-grained star representation model. Then we moved on to Stardable, which was a, a multimodal so vision and language model capable of doing representation and tagging and also captioning uh, using the data. Then we did HyperNST, which is a project where we injected star conditioning into a generative model for the first time, enabling fine-grained star control. Then we moved on to Neat, which is actually still currently state-of-the-art for the star transfer with production model quality. Um, next was Aladdin NST, which was an extension of our first Aladdin project, but with uh, fully disentangled star representation. And finally, Diff NST, which was a diffusion based uh, star transfer for quantum deformity. And I believe that's 45 minutes. So I'll leave that. Thank you.